Hello, my name's Joel Dunning, and I'm delighted to be here at the SDS 2020 uh, with this series of the Giants of Kydothoracic Surgery. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined here with Pat McCarthy, a real giant in our field. Uh, Pat, you went to Notre Dame uh, initially, and then you trained in the Mayo and Stanford, and then went to the Cleveland Clinic, a truly sort of stellar training. Uh, and you're now executive director of the Bloom Cardiovascular uh, Institute. And you've actually got a second career. You're actually a professor of biomechanical engineering as well, uh, if one career is not, not enough. Um, I hear you've done over 500 publications, you've done 10,000 operations, 4,000 4, of which uh, have been mitral surgeries. Uh, and, I, and I hear your oldest patient was 101 as Absolutely. well. So, so I'm delighted to, to have you here. And maybe I'd love to concentrate on, on mitral valves, which is your absolute expert field. But before we start on that, maybe you could tell us about how you really got into cardiothoracic surgery and then the mentors and people that led you to where you are today. Thanks, Joel. Well, first of all, it's a great honor. I really appreciate this. Uh, this is one of the best things that I've received in my career, so I appreciate that. Um, when I was at the Mayo Clinic, uh, when I began, I was going to do either liver transplant or vascular surgery, but not cardiac surgery because it was boring. It was only coronary bypass. And in the 1980s, that's actually what it was. And then I met Jim Pluth, was, uh, he was the chair, and he was one of my first mentors, Jeff Peeler. I learned about heart transplant, valve surgery, ventricular assist devices were beginning. I went to uh, Stanford, Norm Shumway was another of my mentors. Uh, Jim Cox, when I first started at the Cleveland Clinic, I went to Wash U. I got to know Denton Cooley, who gave me one of my most favorite phrases, which is that he said he's a hand surgeon. He operates on anything he can get his hands on. So that was really my mantra for many years. Yeah, and, and tell us about your 101-year-old patient. That's just amazing. So uh, the 101-year-old woman was a, a aortic stenosis patient, and it was back in partner one days when uh, it was just beginning, and she was probably about our sixth patient uh, for TAVR, and some people thought it was incredible. We shouldn't do it. It's almost unethical. I'm happy to report she lived uh, to be 100 and. 11 and uh, at 106 went to Congress. Uh, so uh, she actually lived a good many years afterwards. Yeah. So, so you're an absolute expert in her field about the mitral. You've got extremely good uh, outcome measures. And I, I guess part of that is because you understand so well the engineering of it. And you have a particularly meticulous technique for, for sizing uh, the mitral. Maybe you could give us a few insights about why you're so accurate about it and, and just some hints and tips about sizing mitrals. <laughs> Well, so as I went through my career, I learned how to do this mostly from Toby Cosgrove, and Toby had done thousands and thousands. And so like many that do it so often, he could just size it up and he could eyeball it and he could look and say, this is too short, this is too tall, and I need to do this or that. Um, but it isn't that reproducible. And so about um, 13 years ago, I actually started measuring segments and I started to come up with a process where I make the posterior leaflet half of the anterior leaflet and then I size based on the anterior leaflet not commissure to commissure that doesn't really make sense and so um, with all of this we actually have the manuscript submitted now and it's in review and uh, the tenure results have really been quite good 99.6 percent free from reoperation for a degenerative mitral regurg so uh, it's like putting science in it instead of an art yeah. So people out there, probably the majority of people don't size, do they? And what would your message be to them of the advantages of meticulously sizing? So uh, the message will be read the paper when it gets <laughs> published, first of all, because it's, uh, it's actually very simple math to do it. This is third grade math, uh, but it really works. And we don't see systolic anterior motion either, so uh, it, it works well. And, uh, and in particular, sizing rings and the types of ring, is are all rings the same or, or should you be quite careful about which ring you choose? So they're definitely not the same for ischemic mitral regurgitation or functional mitral regurgitation. You can use different rings for degenerative mitral regurgitation, um, but what I'm relying on is getting a certain amount of coaptation. And so for me, that's a complete remodeling ring so that I know exactly what the coaptation is and it will not change over time. It'll stay that way forever. 
Yeah. And uh, uh, you're one of the co-authors of the STS guidelines on the maze procedure, and uh, uh -huh. you've been following the maze since 1991, I believe. And uh, do you think this is something that is underperformed uh, across the world? Yeah, definitely. So um, when I started at the Cleveland Clinic, um, Fred Loop sent me off to visit Jim Cox, and so I became the second surgeon to do a full classic maze three operation. Jim came and helped me do that. Um, and uh, it's much simpler now, but it's still, you know, there's a lot to this. So we have a different paper that we're working on using cryoablation to do this, and we've um, covered the same lesions, but with less applications of the cryoprobe. And I'm hoping that's gonna to lead to wider, wider adoption because the data is coming out showing that it improves late survival if you do a maze. So we should be doing more of them. Yeah, and, and do you think that's what putting people off? It's the difficult lesions, the mitralismus and tricuspid. I, I think there's so many things that put people off about it. Even when you look at the diagrams, you're looking at it from the back of the heart. We never really look at diagrams except for the maze that way. So uh, we're doing drawings as if from the surgeon's perspective about how to do it. Um, and so, uh, but also just it's a long cardiopulmonary bypass time if you had a Cox Maze 4 procedure to all patients, and that has its risks. And then I guess. Another part of the mitral uh, whole gamut is that uh, repairing the tricuspid valve as well. Do you think this is something that probably isn't done as much as it should? And, and when should somebody repair the tricuspid as well? So yes and no. So I got very interested in the tricuspid when I used to operate on so many cardiomyopathy patients when I ran the heart transplant program at the Cleveland Clinic and did 99 tricuspids one year in cardiomyopathy patients. I have to admit now 70% of my patients are asymptomatic being referred very early, uh, and they don't have a dilated left atrium, and they don't have much tricuspid regurgitation at all. And so uh, for that group, I've gone from 40% repair rate down to 9%. So it's partly because the patients being referred have changed. And, and um, uh, just back on, 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 the, on the maze, one, one important part of it is, is closing the left atrial appendage. Uh, and you wrote yes. some papers on how to do it. You'd think it was easy, wouldn't you? Yeah, it seems like it's easy. And at the end of the surgery, we as surgeons swear it's totally closed and it'll never reopen. But then we get the data and then we do the follow up. And so we're always kind of surprised. I certainly was. Um, so now I do a clip in uh, almost all of them. It's, it's reliable. Yeah, and so you wouldn't suture over and, uh, and excise because they, they leave stumps, don't they? If I am um, doing a reoperation, then you know you can't dig it out to get the clip over on the appendage, and so I close it from inside. And and, and those ischemic patients, I guess it's sort of undersizing for an ischemic person with a poor LV. Um, yeah. You know, is, is that a good thing to do? What, when people get to really poor LVs, I guess that's when people get pretty anxious about doing mitral surgery. Yeah, there were days in the 90s when um, my residents used to add all the ejection fractions together at the end of the day. I'd do three cases and have 50% ejection <laughs> fraction, they told me when they put everything together. Um, I think that I still prefer uh, repair for functional ischemic MR. I think that we haven't solved it yet uh, in terms of there may be subvalvular things that we should be doing more. Uh, the annulus is just a part of the problem. We never claim the annulus is the only thing that you need to do, uh, but we haven't fully solved that yet. But I don't think we should abandon it because a successful repair works better than a replacement. And if we had abandoned uh, degenerative mitral regurgitation because it didn't work well for anterior leaflet disease back in 1990, then we never would have progressed. Mm -hmm. And so there's subsets of the patients that it won't work on well. We should do a better job of identifying them and fix that group. And I suppose more and more these patients are coming for, for a mitral clip. And you're here uh, at the SDS uh, making an amazing announcement about a new study that you've had FDA approval. Maybe you could tell us yeah. a bit about that. So uh, Sable Carr Interventional Cardiology and myself will be the uh, principal investigators uh, for this international trial uh, looking at mitral clip versus surgery for an intermediate or moderate risk patient population. They've done 100,000 um, mitral clips now, so there's a lot of experience. It's a lot different than it was in Everest too. And um, there's that patient population, like I have an 82 year old uh, that I'm seeing you know, he's not prohibitive risk. Uh, and so I can't treat him in the United States. I have a patient in his late 70s with a high creatinine. He 
he's not prohibitive risk. And so for that group of patients, I have equipoise now. If you can do a good job clipping them and get them down to mild, is that as safe, as good an operation as surgery? And the other is two of my surgeons actually perform the mitra clip. And so when the surgeons actually can do either of the repair or the mitra clip, just like Taver versus Saver, as long as the surgeons can do either, they're neutral. And so they're not threatened by the results. And so, so would that be your main, because obviously surgeons often get threatened by, by sort of a non-surgical treatment, but is your message, you know, engage, start learning the mitra clip and, and you know, don't worry about science? Absolutely. For my young uh, surgeons and my trainees, my trainees are finishing with 150 tavers mm -hmm. as surgeon. And so I want them to be able to do those procedures mm -hmm. and, um, and at is actually going to keep the field moving along. Mm -hmm. And then you won't have that creep into the super low risk patients with TAVR and, yeah. and low risk patients should not be treated with mitra clip. They should have mm -hmm. a repair. Right. So this study is for that pretty intermediate risk. What sort of patients are these going to be? So we've estimated from our Northwestern group, it'll be about 13% of the patients will qualify, very similar to, you know, the partner to in Evolute trials that were intermediate risk, you know, a little bit more than the... Uh, than the high risk group, but nothing like low risk. Mm -hmm. So the definitions that we're looking at right now are age 75 or older, so it's elderly patients, less than 75 with a predictive risk of mortality of 2% or more, and then other some, some specific comorbidities. So um, they're actually, they're pretty sick group of patients. All right, yeah, and you're just gonna try and prove non-inferiority. And Correct. So, yeah. Yeah. So great. Yeah, so, so I suppose that message out there is to just to uh, engage. How many st centers do you need? Do you need? Are you looking for centers? We are actually. So we have about ten that uh, are already going through the IRB process, mm -hmm. and then we'll probably go up to about forty. We're looking for five hundred patients to randomize right now. Yeah, wow, a fantastic study. Yeah, that'll it'll be, be interesting. Yeah. And, and I believe you're also sort of uh, uh, doing a study called Intrepid on, on mitral valve transcatheter replacements. What's, what's the future of that and how's that? Yeah, so going? transcatheter mitral replacement makes a lot of sense. It's just that, well, if you think of the patients that you and I actually replace as surgeons, tends to be more rheumatic disease patients. And so, and it's a challenge for the current iteration of the technology to treat them. In particular, those patients don't have a dilated ventricle, so you get into the outflow tract obstruction issue. And so we do a lot of screening for it. We've had three patients treated successfully and they're doing fine, but we've screened at least 30. Um, and uh, even more, really. So um, I think that the functional MR group, maybe if MitraClip can get it down to 2+, plus, that's good, and COAP work, but maybe if you get it to zero, that's even better with a replacement. So we'll see. Yeah. And uh, and so I guess looking for the next five and 10 years in the mitral world, uh, do you think that's it's mit good MitraClip studies in intermediate risk, mitral transcatheter replacement, uh, and, and lots of good quality repair for those fit enough. So they really need the surgeons in this field. The aortic valve, aortic stenosis, is just kind of a simple problem. And in 10 yeah. years, they really solved it. They just, yeah. you know, knocked down all those pins. The mitral valve is much more complicated. Uh, they really need uh, the surgeons involved to figure out the right patients uh, because we have such an incredibly successful operation for that right now. And the bar is set very high, much different from aortic stenosis. Um, I'm actually thinking the progress is going to be sort of slow. I think it's going to take them a while. I think that they're going to creep into not quite as sick patients, but they're a long ways away from treating low risk so far. Yeah. And, and I guess the one thing we haven't talked about is sort of stenotomy versus minimally invasive versus robotic versus there'll be new robots out there. Yeah. You know, where do you think that will go? So uh, I've done all of them except robotics in my days. Mm -hmm. uh, I even did a few hard port back in the 90s and things. I've gone around to a very small incision with a small retractor sternotomy mm -hmm. uh, just because you can fix anything. And I send patients home routinely on day three or four now. And so, um, and it usually is not a very painful incision. Um, robotics, I think, is interesting. There's a company called Verb Surgical that is on the Google campus I visited about two years ago that is going to use artificial intelligence with all the videos 
Um, they're not going to start with cardiac surgery, but you will see more robotics melded with artificial intelligence and videos coming out in the next decade. It'll start with things like gallbladders and simpler things, and then thoracic surgery we'll see it next. Uh, but eventually it'll get to cardiac surgery. So um, it has a future, it's just it's going to take a while. And so, so I guess finally there might be some residents or even students out there, you know, um, if you had your career again, uh, would you recommend it? And do you have any tips for those people who are watching? Yes, I tell the, uh, the residents and all the future so bright, I have to wear shades. <laughs> so, right. well, uh, I think they should stay at it. I think, you know, it has changed so much. I think about when I started my training and I said I would never do cardiac surgery. It's boring. <laughs> and now I look at all the different things that we do. Even 15 years ago, we never thought we would really be able to replace aorta valves without a sternotomy and on cardiopulmonary bypass. Yeah. So it's been really fun. Great. Well, you've had an amazing career and you've been an amazing leader in our specialty. So thank you, Joel. myself and everyone at CTSNet, can I just say thank you very Great. much thank for you. coming to see us. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thanks.